welcome everyone and um, I hope everyone is well and um, in these sort of times of uh, sort of change it's kind of nice that we're still able to communicate our science and uh, hopefully everyone's able to uh, to learn something because I've learned a lot from some of the earlier seminars. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications and advantages of uh, uh, top sims but um, related to uh, FIBSEM instruments, so the combination of those two uh, techniques. Um, I listed a few of my collaborators uh, that I work with, but there's many other collaborators that I, I have worked with that aren't listed, but um, they're uh, cited throughout the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll uh, answer some of them at the end, um, and you, or you can contact me via email. Okay, so... Um, a uh, FIBSM is a wonderful instrument, uh, extremely versatile, capable of doing a lot of things. So I'm just going to minimise something on my screen. Um, and we've highlighted them in some of the earlier um, micro chat uh, on this subject. And so uh, high resolution imaging, we can do site specific sample preparation for TM or Atom probe and a range of micro analyses. If you look at this diagram here on the left, you can see that uh, there's a there's a wealth of information that comes out when both the uh, electron beam or the ion beam uh, interacts with the sample, um, and so that that's really wonderful. And there's plenty of uh, information on, on the internet, um, particularly uh, in the uh, MyScope website on on FIB recently. So if that's of interest, you can check that out. Uh, our FIB uh, at Curtin University uh, has a time of flight SIMS detector on it. So uh, it has a, an additional uh, analysis capability and that's what I'll talk about today. So um, we're combining um, mass spectrometry with, with, with uh, FIBSAM. So we're still able to do all the wonderful things that a FIBSAM can do, but in addition, we can, we can do this sort of extra sort of uh, microanalysis, which which has a number of advantages, and I'll, I'll sort of go through them today. So the, the the way it works, and I'll only briefly go a little bit about the principles of top sims. Uh, I'll mostly focus on the applications, but I can discuss that later if anyone has any questions. Uh, but the way it works, we're using the gallium primary ions. Uh, the sputtering uh, material from the surface, some of that is ionised, can be extracted from the uh, sample, pulse through a time of flight uh, detector and analyze uh, where you're separating the, the masses of, of the different ions. And one of the main advantages in relation to probably the most common microanalysis technique in an SEM is the uh, information volume. So electrons uh, produce information from a relatively large volume of the material compared to ions. So we get surface sensitive inf information and high spatial resolution. And, and the example down here where we're comparing back scattered imaging, which shows so there's sort of uh, a low atomic number matrix with high atomic number particles. When we do that anal elemental analysis by uh, EDS, we sort of, we can detect the particles, but we can't resolve them spatially. Whereas with TOSIMS, uh, we are able to. And it's quite interesting, the fact that we're quite a surface set surface sensitive technique. So in the electron imaging, we can see some buried particles uh, in the top sim. Um, but I'll just sort of quickly, before I get into some applications, uh, just go through exactly what uh, top sims. There's some very um, basic sort of theory. So time of flight uh, is a, a mass analyze, analysis technique. We separate the secondary ions uh, by the time they take to get to the detector. And SIMS being secondary ion mass spectrometry. Um, so we analyze the composition of a surface by sputtering it with an ion beam and collecting and analyzing the ejected secondary ions. Um, something to note is these points down here. So, uh, particularly with people that are uh, only familiar with X ray based techniques, uh, we, we need to have the, the ion to be charged. So, the neutral ions, which is uh, the vast proportion of the sputtered uh, uh, material, uh, we can't analyze them. So we're, we're only analyzing a small portion of the sputtered material, and, and of that portion, there, there is um, a variation in uh, ionization efficiency, and that's dependent on the electron 
structure of that particular element. Uh, they can be either positively or negatively charged, uh, with halogens being uh, uh, primarily uh, negatively charged. And what, what that relates to is we don't have uniform sensitivity across the uh, periodic table. So we have some materials which we have extremely high sensitivity, so we can get down to a few ppm's uh, sensitivity for things like alkali, if we're measuring um, positives. But we have uh, very low sensitive for some um, uh, metals and, and the like. So uh, it, it's dependent on, on what you're analysing. And so this is a positive, and then with the negative ions, you're most sensitive to your halogens, uh, and then sort of you have uh, a reasonable sensitivity for oxygen, silicon, and, and some other uh, elements of interest. So um, there's uh, advantages and disadvantages of that, but the combination with, with other techniques means you can analyse most things in the periodic table. Uh, these relative sensitivity factors uh, are what we use to, to, to compare the sensitivity, in this case using silicon as a baseline. Uh, most of the published values out there are for conventional topsiums, so using an oxygen or a cesium source. Uh, there's less for uh, typical FIBSEM sources such as gallium, but there is some information out there. But what I've found is actually it's quite comparable just to use uh, the other, the published information for, uh, for oxygen and, and cesium as a broad sort of baseline for, for uh, analysis with gallium. And you can see here, this is typically the way we uh, do our analysis. So for positive analyses, we're, we're analysing these yellow elements and for negative these are green elements. So exactly how this analysis occurs, so uh, we set up our FIBSAM much in the way we would do for any other normal analysis. Um, we operate the FIBSAM uh, between sort of 10 kV and 30 kV. Uh, for higher spatial resolution we use uh, higher voltage for better uh, depth profiling a Z resolution, we're using a lower voltage. Uh, and then we sort of adjust our current density in our analysis region to, to set our signal strength. And, and this is a sort of reasonable rule of thumb for us. Um, so we're analysing a square region. Uh, primarily we analyse with the iron beam normal to the surface. So we uh, spot the material away. Um, Every uh, analysis point, we're getting a um, time of flight spectrum. Uh, and so we generate a data cube over the analyzed uh, volume. And this is a, a screenshot of, of the analysis software. So we can see our, our 2D image. We can see our, our, our sort of cross-sectional image, our mass spectra, and our depth profile. So we can see the change in concentrations of various ions as you actually sputtering uh, down through the surface of the sample. And, and it's a, a nice advantage that we have a, an electron microscope at the same time and we can actually image this sputter pit live during the analysis or uh, uh, at the end of the analysis to, uh, to determine its depth to a relatively uh, reasonably accurate um, state. Okay, so from here, um, I'll just go through a number of applications um, in sort of the sort of and uh, coralline analyses. Uh, and I'll just go through, I'm jumping through a few different materials, but the, 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 the principles will be the same and um, it's sort of highlighting some of the, the, the real advantages of the technique. Okay, so imaging. Um, so there's some published examples of sort of resolution standards and the like. Um, this uh, BAM um, certified reference material is commonly used in um, in SIMS to 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 set a resolution, uh, and this uh, particular uh, system is able to sort of achieve sort of sub 100 um, nanometer resolution with published sort of values down to about 50 nanometers. And so this is uh, an example there. Uh, and another example from um, the manufacturer, uh, sort of looking at nanoparticles on a surface, and you can see looking at it, two micron nanoparticles, half micron nanoparticles, and 100 na or 90 nanometer nanoparticles, and they're, they're easily resolvable. 
In this case here, we're looking at a one micron by one micron um, map. So we can really focus the beam down to analyze a very small region. Um, an example from, from uh, our lab, um, we're looking at a mineral sample. So in this case, it has a plagioclase phase in a triple uh, point junction with a, a olivine. Uh, and what we, we sort of identified here was that there was a, a very uh, fine structure, uh, uh, rich in potassium. And we, we analyzed a sort of five micron by five micron region with a sort of 20 nanometer pixel size. So we were uh, quite uh, easily able to resolve some of these um, fine structures uh, and simultaneously looking at the, the trace element chemistry and the, and the bulk uh, chemistry. Uh, in this particular example, we analyze it not just at, uh, in the, across the surface, we also analyze it in cross section. So we did, um, we we're particularly interested in this uh, part of the material. So we prepared it for TEM. We're using our FIB, the same instrument, um, to confirm that we had this material in the cross section. We, we did topsims on it prior to final thinning uh, uh, when we did TEM. So, it shows that we can really analyze this uh, fine structure uh, at high resolution in a semi-non-destructive uh, fashion uh, and prior to a, a sub um, well, so nanoscale imaging with a tier. That's very useful. A really uh, other um, nice advantage of uh, SIMS is light element analysis. So for EDS and other X-ray based techniques, light elements are extremely difficult to uh, analyze, whereas conversely for SIMS, um, alkali is extremely sensitive and, and therefore very easy for us to analyze. So we can uh, produce uh, very nice uh, uh, maps of uh, lithium uh, with, with, with absolute ease. So, and we do that and we can uh, look at uh, mineral samples. So looking at, this case mica, so we're looking at the variation, sort of the you know, micron scale variation in lithium concentration in a mineral, or we can uh, look at batteries. So you can look at charge and discharge states of uh, lithium batteries and actually see uh, the lithium uh, moving around. So this this area in particular is a, a area where uh, a lot of people are doing some uh, research and at Curtin University, that there, there are a number of projects with the Future Batteries Industry CRCs, where they're going to be looking at that. Um, so I, I mentioned briefly about trace element analysis. So uh, with time of flight, we get all the ions uh, in a uh, single analysis, well, uh, or call the detectable ions. Uh, so we're getting the majors and the, the minors. So where our um, sensitivity is good enough to detect a trace element, so in um, EDS, often a uh, uh, concentration of sort of much less than 0.5 weight percent is quite difficult to analyze. Whereas uh, in top sims, if you, uh, for the relatively high sensitive materials, you can analyze into the PPM range, which is very useful for things such as mineral samples where you're looking at um, trace element composition. So in this case here is a zircon grain with a polymorph of redite. So same chemical composition in the major, but a, a potentially different trace element composition. In this case here, we're able to look at these uh, ladder-like structures and, and uh, determine that there was uh, some variation in the trace element composition, which had a relationship with the cathodal luminescence signal, uh, which is of uh, interest in this study. Um, some work with it, which I... Dr. Wong Long and uh, PhD student Hugh and Van. Um, We've looked at um, some uh, semi-transparent uh, perovskite solar cells and what's of interest in these, they have a very fine uh, uh, sort of half micron thick surface layer with the active region and they have sort of two major phases in that thing. So they have the inorganic sort of stabilizers amongst the sort of organic matrix. Uh, and what's quite neat is a sort of uh, inorganic, inorganic phase uh, of, of quite easily to analyze by Topsium, so we get to um, cesium, rubidium, bromium. Um, and although uh, gallium fib based um, topsiums has limited uh, ability to analyze organics because the gallium 
tends to break most of the molecular bonds. Uh, it does preserve some of the small organic molecules. In this case, we were able to uh, map the distribution of ammonia, ammonium uh, in amongst the inorganic. So we can do some organic analysis, but uh, primarily we're using this for inorganic analysis. But the, these very fine uh, particles are easily resolvable. And it's quite nice to be combined with uh, SEM imaging. Okay, so depth profiling. So this is the ability to actually sputter material away and look at the concentration of uh, a certain iron with depth, uh, which allows us to look below the surface of samples. So back in the, the same example I mentioned before, uh, so we have these solar cells, uh, and in cross-section you can see this sort of this uh, layer and, and within that layer some of these uh, particles are at the surface but some of them are actually buried uh, and it was of interest looking at, at these particles. Um, so, so when we analyse the sample we can actually image it uh, live and, and actually that was quite useful for identifying um, where you've got issues with variable sputter rates so uh, we were able to tailor our analysis conditions to minimise that. Um, and then post analysis, we can use the SEM to measure the, the, the depth of this sputter pit. In this case, it was around 500 nanometers. Uh, and then we can, uh, when we're processing our data, we can extract uh, a map, so a lateral distribution map from a certain region within the analysis volume. So this is uh, in Z versus X. Uh, and then we can extract a, a surface X versus Y. Um, distribution. So that's, that's really neat and it's quite nice to be able to overlay that with your electron uh, image. So we've got nice uh, uh, morphological analysis by electron microscopy and then a chemical analysis by time of flight sims. So in another example of depth profile in this case here highlighting a, a relatively high uh, Z resolution. So we're looking at solid oxide fuel cells and they have an um, a, a electrolyte uh, and, a, and a anode and looking at specifically the interface between these, in this case here, uterostrate stabilized zirconia and a, a porous material which is, contains lanthanum, strontium, cobalt and iron. And at this, this immediate interface forms this, uh, this reaction layer. So when we analyze that um, in, in this region similar to this, um, we can see our change in concentration of various ions, um, and we can see a drop in the strontium concentration uh, concurrent with an increase in the, the concentration of zirconia. So we're, we're going through the reaction layer into the substrate. Um, and when we also use our FIPSAM to extract a, a foil for TM uh, analysis, we, we did EDS, and we get um, comparative sort of results in cross-section so uh, we can see the strontium uh, interface or strontium rich interface uh, uh, is approximately 30 nanometers thick, which is uh, equivalent to the results we got with the top sim. So it's quite neat to be able to do a chemical analysis uh, from the top down um, without having to do a, a cross section uh, if we didn't need to. Okay, so um, we can do some analysis uh, using the mass spectra. So we can do some um, mass spectrometry with our FIBSEM. Um, not as powerful as a dedicated mass spectrometer, but when you uh, complement it with other analysis techniques, it, it, uh, it's a, has a number of advantages, and I'll show you some of them. So this is a, a, another mineral sample. Uh, with a very fine structure and chemically when we analyze it we can see this very fine distribution in, in potassium. So in this uh, example we wanted to look at the uh, what, what was the composition of the potassium poor regions versus the potassium rich regions um, and because our information volume by SIMS is very small we can actually extract the data from a small region about the size of this spot and uh, have a reasonable confidence that, that that information has come from that that just that region rather than being an average over a larger region, which is what you'd probably expect with uh, like EDS analysis. Um, so, uh, 
Aí... So you can see the, they're, they're quite different. One being rich in the calcium and, the, and magnesium, and the other one being rich in aluminous silicates. Um, another example of isotopic analysis is looking at um, heavily enriched um, zinc oxide. So uh, uh, this technique is probably not uh, suitable for very subtle enrichments. So just a, often natural enrichments uh, or, or a, uh, slight enrichments that occur uh, in nature are, are required to be analysed by a dedicated uh, mass spectrometer. But in material science, there's often very high enrichments. So in this case here, enriching uh, uh, zinc oxide nanowires, we can actually uh, determine um, the amount of enrichment on a very small um, material. So in this case here, these are the various isotopes of, of zinc. The natural abundance having these sort of relative proportions. And, uh, and you can see here in the three different uh, enrichments uh, being 64 enrichment uh, being relatively high, being 70%, uh, 66 being almost 90%, and uh, 68, 55%. So that those. Uh, Percentages are determined by uh, analysis of the peak, so looking at the peak area and, and comparing them between the different uh, isotopes. So it's quite neat to be able to do that in, in combination with the imaging. And if you did that with the elemental analysis, uh, it, all these isotopes are purely uh, will only come up as zinc uh, by EDS. Uh, in this other uh, isotopic analysis example, we're looking at um, sort of um, very small particles, so particles in the order of just a, a micron or so, uh, and, and we can actually analyse individual particles, look at the isotope ratio, in this case these are uranium uh, particles, and just determine whether that uranium has a uh, look at the 238 to 235 ratio uh, of each of these particles. In this case here we're analysing a standard, which should have about 1% um, ratio, so 1%, 235, 238. And, and when in our analysis, we, we got very close to the expected value of the standard. So uh, from from that, we were sort of confident we could use our uh, instrument for some um, basic analysis uh, of isotopic ratios in uranium, which is which is quite neat because you can also combine that with the high resolution uh, imaging uh, and EDS. Okay, so I've talked uh, about a couple of correlative um, analysis where we've used, uh, say, TOPSIMS and, and TM. Uh, in this case here, I'll go through an example where we use a, a full suite of techniques and show how uh, how it links in. And really what, what we're trying to do here is um, link between the different sort of analyses. So in particular, when we're doing chemical analyses, we really want to be able to link... Um, our nanoscale analyses by atom probe or TM with our micro scale analyses by, by EDS, uh, XRD, XRF and, and the like. So uh, what, what's quite neat is this top sim sort of sits between these two length scales um, and, and can really sort of provide that link, uh, which, is, which is what we've been able to do. Uh, in this example, uh, I'll just go through that we did a full characterization of this technique because it was quite a valuable sample uh, provided by the Japanese Space Agency, um, a, a particle from the Itakawa asteroid. So they did some um, basic SEM analysis. Um, when we received the sample, we did some sort of surface imaging. Then we did some um, bulk chemical analysis by EDS. Uh, and then... Uh, so we identified a range of different chemical regions. Um, so in this case here, this sodium rich region, slight variation in the potassium. Um, then we want to know, so we, the idea of the sort of um, chemistry, but now we want to know the phase composition. So we can use electron backscatter diffraction so that we can identify the different uh, uh, minerals in a sample. And we do that. And even within a, a single mineral, they can often have some microstructure. In this case here, they had grain boundaries and twinning. So we get information from all that. 
Uh, and then when we want to know about the trace element composition, we use top sims. Um, so we did a range of different maps. So you can see we can do small maps and larger maps. And we In this presentation, this sort of feather feature emanating from a grain boundary, uh, but also you can see a depletion in um, following the twin interfaces that we identified earlier by uh, EBSD. So we're combining our, we're sort of building our information from the samples by a range of different sources. Uh, and if you sort of look at our EDS map uh, zoomed in, we're, we're not getting, we can see a slight hint of a concentration of, of potassium, but we're not getting anywhere near the fine structure that we can analyze by TOSIMS. That's purely because of the uh, small information volume. Uh, so this sample, uh, we did uh, TM and Adam probe on that. And the way we sort of linked our, our top sims analysis, being the squared regions with our uh, Adam probe and our TM, is we actually uh, put sort of fiducial markers across it. In this case here, we use our gas injection system to deposit uh, platinum uh, uh, buttons on the sample and then overlaid our, our maps and sort of targeted specific feather features. Uh, and, and then when we sort of look at our, our TM and our Atom Probe results, so our TM, we can see these feather features. Uh, in the Atom Probe, we can, in 3D, with sort of one nanometer or, or less uh, resolution, we can actually look at the chemistry uh, and, and quantitatively determine the, the uh, uh, abundances of the various region. So th that was really useful uh, by combining this sort of full suite of characterization for, for a particular sample. And, and you'll also know as we start from the relatively, from the non-destructive and move around to our slightly destructive at the immediate surface to our uh, full dis uh, destructive uh, lift outs. So we, we sort of have a workflow which sort of allows us to get as much information as possible. So uh, in sort of summarising some of the advantages and disadvantages um, of the so of, of focused iron beam based top sims, so the massive advantage is having an electron microscope to for navigation and imaging. Uh, so for instance, if you're looking for, for a high atomic element, um, we can look over millimetre field of view uh, with our back saddle detector and, and straight away see that. So it's a really, really high advantage. Uh, and we can analyze our sample before and after analysis. Uh, we can do our uh, EDS and EBSD, which is uh, quantitative. One of the limitations of top sims is it's uh, very hard to quantify. Um, and then we can use our FIBSEM for our uh, complementary analysis or site specific lift outs. Uh, with a gallium-based FIBSAM, uh, it can be very fast to do sputter material away um, in comparison to a, a, a TOSIMS uh, instrument, which has a, a lower, sput lower current source. Um, so there's a couple of advantages that you can read. Uh, and the disadvantages, uh, we're, we're in a sort of fairly conventional uh, uh, SEM chamber. So we don't have the ultra high vacuum, which uh, allows for higher sensitivity and also less contamination. So we, we do have some limitations uh, in, caused by that. Uh, our mass resolution uh, is, is in, in our particular systems only around about 600, which allows us to analyze individual sort of monoatomic ions, but not uh, molecules or uh, uh, if there's a particular interference, so for instance, if you're looking at sulfur at 32 and there's a potential that there's uh, uh, oxygen 2 in the sample, so you, oxygen coming off at 16 uh, being a double mass, what we get coming off at 32, we won't be able to resolve the, the, the interference between those two. So that has some limitations in some samples. Um, we have a gallium source, which is really great for FIBSEM. Uh, it has some uh, disadvantages in some top sims. So we, we basically, because we've got a multifunctional instrument, there is some uh, 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 limitations. Um, but you, you sort of weigh up the, the different advantages. Um, so uh, I mentioned before about molecular analysis. We can do some, but uh, the a gallium ion is, is, is less advantageous for... Uh, molecular analysis because it often breaks most of the molecular bonds. Um, 
So we, our, our sensitivity is not uniform. We have some limited sensitivity for different elements. Um, it, it's definitely not a static analysis. So in the world of uh, uh, mass spectrometry, there's static and um, dynamic analyses, and static being relatively non-destructive. Uh, we, we're we not in that regime with a high current fib. Uh, so uh, I think the combination of SIMS with uh, electron microscopy is extremely powerful. Um, they have advantages uh, for a number of different studies. And really the big thing is being able to do submicron chemistry and morphology at the same time in the same instrument, which is really, really useful. Uh, and so we've applied that across a, quite a wide range of subject matter fields uh, and, and with some really nice results. So uh, if you've got any, any questions on any of that, uh, feel free to, to contact. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you very much, William. That's an excellent talk. Uh, so, um, now it's actually question time. So, um, any, 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 anyone uh, got any questions, feel free to put it through the chat box. Or if it's uh, more complicated to tap up, uh, you can always turn on a microphone and talk to uh, William directly. Um, I th think we have first one from Jeff Chen from ANU. Um, asking about, can you please comment on the difficulties in element quantification using TOFSIMS, uh, the matrix yep. effect, yep. Yeah, thanks for your question, uh, uh, Jeff. Um, yes, it's very difficult. <laughs> um, so element, uh, the matrix effects will affect, so the local um, bonding uh, arrangement with a particular um, atom will affect uh, how easily it will ionize. So therefore, uh, it, you'll get a variation in ionization for the same concentration in a different uh, material. Um, so quantification you, by SIMS in general is, is often uh, achieved using standards. So if you have a standard of a similar composition, a uh, similar matrix, then you, then you could uh, 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 set a calibration curve by looking at a range of concentrations and then analyze your sample. So that, that's why it's done. It's not easy, but it can be done to a certain extent uh, using this technique. Um, I can see there's a, um, another question from um, uh, about uh, charging of uh, insulating samples. So that's a very good question. So um, uh, we have a positively charged ion source which will, will cause charging in a similar way a negatively charged electron beam would. Um, so the, the easiest way to, to reduce it, obviously use a, a coded sample as you would with normal SEM. Uh, when we sputter the sample, we're removing that coating so then we get, start to get charging. You can um, use an electron flood gun to, to uh, reduce charging in a similar way you would in, in other top sims techniques. But a lot of um, FIBSAM instruments don't have a flood gun, but they do have an electron gun. So you can use the electron gun uh, during the analysis to, to charge compensate. Uh, it is of, uh, not as effective as a flood gun, but it can be used. And I have some examples where it, it's worked quite well. Um, so, yeah. Um, Okay, another question on depth profile. Is it sensitive to alkali metals, uh, lith uh, sodium and lithium? And uh, absolutely, that's probably our easiest things to analyze. So if you want a depth profile sodium and lithium, that, that, that's, that's a very straightforward thing to do. So that was a question from George. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going through the group chats. If you want to uh, do a question, either sing out or I'll go through the chat. Um, okay. So do I have any, from Alicia, um, do I have any experience analyzing spot germane? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, that is a material, uh, you can see in this uh, exam, process metallurgy uh, example here, and you can follow this publication, uh, analyzing spot germane. Uh, works uh, quite well. One of the, one of the minerals that where it is quite insulating, so we did use electron beam charge compensation uh, to relatively good effect. So, uh, yep. Uh, quite good for analyzing spot Um 
So, uh, George said, what's the dimension of the measurable uh, regions? So, uh, effectively, where you scan your FIB is where you can scan your, uh, where you can get your analysis from. However, you need to achieve a certain sort of uh, uh, spot size matching your uh, probe. Um, uh, so, the pixel size in the analysis matching the, the spot size in the FIB. Uh, and you also want to get a sufficient sort of current density to get uh, high signal to noise. So, optimum 50 microns uh, by 50 microns or less. So, you can go slightly high. You can probably go to 100 microns by 100 microns. But often, where where you, by the time you get to a larger field of view, you for a lot of times when you're looking at bulk chemistry, you, you may 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 be better off using EDS. Uh, but when we really want to make advantage of the high resolution, um, we, we want to use a smaller field of view, such as 20 microns by 20 microns, or down to all the way down to one micron by one micron, if you want. Uh, so the next question uh, from uh, Ruxu Wang: uh, question on depth profiling. Is it is it sensitive to gold? Um, gold is is a tricky material, so there's very low sensitive sensitivity to gold. Uh, often you would analyze gold uh, in a negative uh, mode. We have tried it um, for, for, for gold at concentrations that we can detect. So we can de detect gold, but often you probably uh, in the sort of weight percent uh, concentrations where you'd probably be better off using uh, EDS. Um, so um, Meng Bin uh, asked a question, can we, can, can you give your thoughts on X-ray or gamma ray technology compared to top sims? Um, so X-ray technology, XRF, um, number of advantages for trace element analysis, uh, and it can be uh, uh, quantitative, but has uh, limitations in, in focusing a, a X-ray beam down, so your spatial resolution is reduced. Uh, for gamma ray technology, I'm less familiar with that, so I, I, I'm probably not able to uh, to comment on that. Um, Annalena has uh, asked, with so many different iron species to choose from in FIBSEMS, uh, now if you could choose what iron species would you pick? Uh, good question. So it's really uh, 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 neat that we uh, now, there's plasma FIBS um, and they have, uh, a range of different iron sources, even people using helium iron uh, fibs for, for top sims um, or for some forms of sims in the fib. So, uh, yes, xenon has a number of advantages uh, for top sims, uh, uh, higher, um, a higher sputtering rate and you can uh, translate to a higher uh, detection rates, uh, so you can analyze more trace elements. So xenon plasma would, would be something of interest, and I believe there's, there's a um, system in Australia that's capable of doing that. Another question from Nankaro, uh, do you find uh, large changes in a collection yield with in-chamber detector setup bias on Everhart Thornley detectors? Uh, yes, so you you, you, def, you definitely want to set up your chamber so there's not a uh, another bias in your your chamber pulling away your um, your ions. So in this case, I turn my secondary ion detector off and my in beam detectors off, so that uh, reduces the, the field pulling the ions to another detector. Um, so yes, I think I answered your question. If I haven't, let me know. Uh, I saw George say, does the CMM have the um, facility? I think we could answer that. Uh, yeah, this I'll answer this one. Unfortunately, we don't have such a facility available at CMM at the moment. We would love to, but no for the answer at the moment. Uh, if, you, if you are of interest, you can uh, get in contact with me via email and we potentially can arrange for you to send me a sample. Uh, of course, of course. I think we do have a fair, fair number of groups working on lithium-ion batteries. And um, um, after today's talk, I think if, they, uh, if possible, we might um, get some conversation started and maybe some, some opportunity to do some, some tests down there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I see another question from uh, Alicia. Um, can you recommend other analytical techniques to measure lithium? So there's a range of different techniques to measure lithium. Uh, uh, mass spectrometry is very good. So uh, one of the nice mass spectrometry techniques is laser ablation, uh, ICPMS. Uh, very quantitative and look at uh, PPM concentrations of lithium. Uh, and we use that in, also in that same paper for our quantitative analysis. Uh, so we, we use that for our basically spot analysis. In this case here, the spot size is around 30 microns. So we can get a concentration average over a relatively large volume. Uh, and then we use, we do that in combination with imaging where we can see the concentration over a much smaller length scale. So uh, yep, it's, it's very good to compare with other techniques. Um, I can see uh, one more question from Mengbin. If you, uh, if you choose the best application from many, which one will you pick? Um, well, the best application is uh, the one you're currently uh, uh, using. So uh, it, I wouldn't wouldn't say uh, we we have done a lot of work in, in geochemistry, so that that's a particular strength of our uh, research groups at Curtin. Um, but this can be applied to a, a number of different areas.